Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a great pleasure to see uh, Esther again. <clears throat> and of course, she's absolutely right. Uh, it's very important uh, to know what you're doing, whether you get paid for it or not. Uh, I want to tell you the story so far, uh, which is all about intelligent machines. And what, what I've done <clears throat> is I've uh, <clears throat> divided the screen into two halves. The left half is the intelligent machine uh, that was produced by evolution. That's us, biological intelligent machines, and the one on the right that's been designed by us, uh, intelligent uh, machines. So the contents uh, will be about the biological machines. They have neurons, brains, ears, eyes, legs, and so on. <clears throat> and the artificial ones have equivalents. So the equivalent to a neuron, of course, is the transistor. The brain uh, is a computer. The ears are the microphones, uh, and so on. And I'll go into a little bit of detail on that because there's some very surprising results. Neurons are huge. They're about 20 microns. So they're a 1,000 times larger uh, than transistors. Neurons are slow. They only uh, send a spike out uh, every uh, uh, millisecond, so it's about a kilohertz. Uh, <clears throat> our transistors now in computers run at a gigahertz. That's a million times faster. The brain has about 100 uh, billion of them. Uh, the biggest uh, chips that we have are about 10, uh, but also getting on for 100 billion. But the big, big secret of the brain is the 100 trillion connections. So every neuron, on average, has 1,000 to 10,000 uh, oh. connections. So if you look at what a neuron looks like, it's actually incredibly complex because it needs to be a cell, uh, therefore it needs to live. Uh, it has these uh, 10,000, do we have a, a pointer now? Ah, I know, a pointer goes like this, does it? Well, it used to. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got these dendrites that collect the information from up to 10,000 neurons, and then you've got the axon uh, that again spews it out to, uh, to uh, 10,000 connections. So there's quite a complexity in the neuron, and this is the function that a neuron uh, performs, which is collecting all, this, all these inputs, summing them, and then if the sum of the inputs reaches a certain threshold, then it fires. So, and this is a spike train at the bottom. This is what a, a neuron sounds like when you, when you listen to it. Now, transistor, in uh, contrast, is really very Simple, it only has three um, components. The source of the electrons, then the gate on whether the electrons will be allowed through or not, and then the drain. And this is what a transistor looks like, uh, put together into a NAND gate. NAND gate is the sort of universal building block of all our computers. You can build any logic function out of NAND gates. And this is the truth table. It's, uh, it's a sort of yes or no table. And then uh, this, instead of a spike train, you have these nice clocks. And if you want to uh, do something analog, you can put them together into these uh, waveforms. But we think with our brains. So let's compare our brains with the best computers that we have. And note on the right-hand side this package here, uh, which has 512 gigabytes of memory in one package, and it just weighs one gram. We'll come back to this. Uh, in a moment, and at the bottom, we've got the most powerful single computer, which is a GPU, and let's compare that with the brain. So the brain has a capacity of between 10 and 100 terabytes. It's a bit difficult to um, <clears throat> calculate, but because of the package that I showed you in the previous slide, uh, we actually now have semiconductor memory that's bigger than our brain per kilogram. So if you take 1,000 of those, you get uh, 500 terabytes. This came as a big surprise to me. I did not know that semiconductor memory now could hold more a memory than our brain. However, we're still winning in the processing power uh, stakes. So our brain is <coughs> estimated to have a performance of between 10 and uh, 10 petaflops and one exaflop. So X is 10 to the 18 and a flop is a floating point operation per second. And the best we can do with the best GPUs is about 10 teraflops. So our brain is actually still a thousand times, uh, has a thousand times higher performance than the highest performance uh, computer that uh, we've managed to uh, develop. Now this uh, is impressive, but not as impressive as the power consumption that we do it with. 
We do it all with just 20 watts. The equivalent, if we built the same uh, performance with computers, they would consume 200 kilowatts. So we are 10,000 times more efficient in uh, calculating uh, <clears throat> and perceiving things in this world than computers. This is something we can be proud of. The biggest secret of the power of the brain are the 100 trillion connections there. This is, we still don't understand why it is that neurons that are connected to 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons have this incredibly high performance, although the actual clock is only a kilohertz. And this is the way they're organized in the brain. They're massively parallel uh, computers, and we haven't figured out how this uh, works quite yet. The memory is distributed, and the connectivity is sparse. Uh, now, this is a picture of the main highways in the brain. It's called the human connectome, uh, and it was uh, collected through MRI pictures uh, developed by a, a university, a perfectly respectable university, the west of Cambridge, um, using uh, 200 uh, different brain regions of, of 460 people. And here is the uh, equivalent. Uh, this is quite a, a, an interesting and potentially epochal event, uh, this intelligent processing unit, because it is only the third time in the history of computing that we needed a new type of processor. The first time it was the change from CISC to RISC, from complex instruction set computer to reduced instruction set computer, and of course that was the rise of the ARM, uh, which is the, my proudest uh, achievement. Uh, and is now you know, the best-selling microprocessor in the world. We're, we're outselling Intel 20 to 1. The second time, it was when we needed a special processor for video because uh, our screens are the main route into a human brain through our eyes. And that's the graphical processing unit. The surprising result is that for machine learning, there is no, uh, we, we've topped out with microprocessors at about um, three gigahertz. We can't go faster because of the speed of light, uh, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So the only way of getting more performance out of the chip is by having lots of processing units run at the same time. But there is no generic solution to the parallelization problem. As luck will have it, machine learning typically works on very large databases, so you can actually break up the um, job into lots of different processes. And this Graphcore IPU, which is a company in uh, Bristol, which might well become the microprocessor of choice for machine learning, has 7,000 processors on it, 350 megabytes of RAM, and implements a completely new type of architecture called the bulk synchronization protocol, which so far has only ever been implemented in software. So how do we hear? Well, we hear with our ears, of course, uh, and the computers here with our microphones. And let's just compare how the two compare. And as you would expect, microphones are actually miles better in every respect. Uh, the particular thing that has happened, which enables our change from a touch interface to a voice interface, are these beam-forming microphones, like in the Echo and in Google Home. And uh, the trick is uh, that the um, Alexa can home in on where the speech is coming from, because it has got seven microphones at the top. So it can form a beam to just listen to, to where the mouth is and shut out all the other noise. And that's the reason why you can now have voice recognition across the room. How do we see? Well, with our eyes. And of course, computer sees, see with um, cameras. And as you would expect, we really miss out here uh, as well, because, of course, we've got uh, um, microscopes that are a lot better and telescopes. But the most fantastic thing is actually the speed of cameras, which is in the picosecond era. And picoseconds are so fast uh, that light actually travels a foot a nanosecond. A picosecond is a thousandth of a nanosecond. So there are pictures in MIT where they switch on the light for the stage on the right. And you can see the camera watching the light go 
illuminating part of the stage as the light hits the stage because uh, the camera is faster than the light. It's quite a, an amazing achievement. And this is just the tiny bit of electromagnetic spectrum that we can see with our eyes. So as you see, co uh, computers and artificial intelligences have a much uh, greater co uh, connectivity with the real world. But the main difference is actually the fact that we have two eyes and cameras. There are about 100,000 web cameras. And that is the reason why self-driving cars will be so much safer uh, than we are, because look at the number of um, cameras, which is typically 16, four to the front, two on each side, two at the back. We don't have eyes in our back, radar, LIDAR. Uh, so it's easy to see why it is that self-driving cars uh, will be uh, much safer. Now, there is this huge change going on, uh, and one of the first real effects of AI on our daily lives are going to be autonomous cars. And uh, I will now show you the person who is responsible for this change of driving your own and owning your own petrol car to being driven, transport as a service, uh, in an electric car. And um, this is him. Come on. <laughs> this is my son, Michael. Now, why is he responsible for that? Well, when he turned 18, I said, Michael, are you going to get your driving license? And he says, what for? I said, Michael, well, to drive a car. And he says, what would I want to do that for? I, I just couldn't understand this, because when I was 18, the most important thing in my life is to drive a car. You know, how can you not want to drive a car? He's not interested in cars. Uh, <clears throat> because he lives in London, he's very happy with tra public transport, a car would be a millstone around his neck, he'd find to, uh, would have to find a, a parking space, and he'd have to find a lot of money to buy one in the first place. So I thought he was a Cambridge-educated weirdo until he, I talked to all his friends, and they have the same attitude. They don't have that relationship with cars uh, that we have. And the final uh, thing that convinced me that this change was secular was when I drove through Innsbruck with my brother, and we followed a car that was driving very slowly. And he said, I bet you there's a young person in that car. And I said, why? Young people always drive far too fast. That's what we do. No, 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 he says. We had this joy of driving you know, on the open road, because there was still an open road there. These young guys have the fear of driving, because there's so many regulations, there's so much traffic that they have to deal with. And the first time you're in a car and you're <coughs> subjected to all the traffic rules and all the, the, the other car, this, they, they actually fear to drive rather than love to drive. So transport as a service is really the first real uh, implementation of a significant AI that will change our lives. And in my opinion, for the better, because we'll have Self-driving cars that can drive all people wherever uh, they want to go, they will be a lot safer. And uh, if you do the sums, and we've, uh, uh, one of my companies is 5AI that hopes to be the first robo-taxi company in London, the cost uh, will be the cost of a bus. So even the uh, commercial arguments, the economic arguments, are very much in favor uh, of this. So here we go and look at legs. You know, we have these uh, funny legs with, uh, uh, you know, the way they're uh, structured here. If you have design freedom, uh, you can produce legs uh, that um, are quite different, like that from Boston Dynamics. Now, let's see if I can get a um, video going here. Here we go. So this is what you can do when you have complete design freedom. Instead of feet, you can uh, put some wheels uh, on the bottom of your legs. And surprisingly, uh, this uh, works amazingly well. Of course, you can run much faster because you've got wheels. Um, the software now is good enough to have really pretty good control uh, over this machine, as you can see. So it can do pirouettes and it can do the squats. Uh -huh. But we'll see in a moment. Yeah, and then here is a, a pirouette. But we'll see in a moment that the, oh yes, it can do that, it can lift a leg without <laughs> falling over. But here, this is quite difficult. You know, you, you define um, an XYZ point and uh, that funny concoction of a, 
a leg with a, a wheel can actually hold it very steady. And then if you have design freedom, you might pick up loads in a way that a human wouldn't think uh, of doing. But, but because uh, it's structured like that, that's, uh, that's the way. It can even go downstairs, which uh, came as a big surprise to me. And if you now look, this is uh, winter and there's snow out there, and it goes down a hill and will slip in a moment. And still doesn't over, see that? It still doesn't fall over. So the control we have of, of really a, what looks quite an, an unstable uh, uh, robot is really quite well. Uh, it's really quite good. And uh, it even can jump for joy. So <clears throat> let's go back to our slides. Um, I organized a, uh, uh, the first uh, machine learning uh, conference at the Royal Society. I'm the only venture capitalist in the world who is also a fellow of the Royal Society, which I'm more proud of than my, uh, my knighthood. And we defined what machine learning is. And it's a, sim a system <coughs> that learns from data rather than following pre-programmed pre rules. We also have now um, published a report on machine learning with Demi Sassabis and a number of uh, the key uh, thinkers in this um, uh, space, and uh, you can get it on the, uh, on the website. Uh, and here are all the different uh, machine learning things, and of course, machine learning, as you all know, has been spectacularly successful already. If there is a one slide I want you to remember, it's this slide, and it's very similar to what Esther Dyson said about the importance of, uh, of goals. And this slide uh, really shows you that the uh, image that we have of computers, that they work on zeros and ones, the binary system, has seduced us into thinking that we can describe the world in a first, pro, uh, first order predicate calculus, that things are either true or they're false. It turns out that that's not a very good way of describing the world. The best way of describing the world is with probabilities. Now, you give up determinism, everything becomes statistical, but you don't need to program so much because you can teach. You can teach the computer by serving up uh, a good data set that they can um, uh, work on themselves, but it needs big data. However, the biggest problem is not the big data, but what uh, we want these AIs to do. Now, in the case of the um, autonomous cars, it's easy to define to get us safely to wherever we want to go. But in general, we're actually quite bad at defining goals for ourselves. And that's what I call the genie problem, because we normally don't know uh, what is good for us and don't know what to wish for. So having a common uh, way of working out amongst ourselves what our goals are as humanity is, I think, the key problem for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And that's why I'm proudly wearing my sustainable development goals. Uh, then you know the stories about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, I just want to uh, talk about Life 3.0, which is a very interesting book by Max Tegmark, where 1.0 is the nematode worm, where both the hardware and the software are evolved. Life 2.0 is us, where the hardware <coughs> is still evolution determined, but the software is designed. Uh, and the culture, you know, we can teach our children how to speak and where to find food. And life 3 Dodo is when we take control of our hardware. And this is the most exciting uh, uh, investment that I have at the moment, a company called Evonetics uh, that has a, a pixel flow technology that allows us to do gene synthesis. And once you can do base accurate gene synthesis, uh, you really take control of life with all the positive aspects of being able to get rid of all inherited uh, monogenetic diseases uh, and all the scary things of uh, taking control of life. Uh, you know, this I just want to uh, <clears throat> uh, talk about disruption, you know, the arm disruption where we are outselling and uh, outcompeting Intel uh, easily, and you'll hear more about this later. Uh, but the main effect is really on the car industry, uh, where again we've got a technical change <clears throat> combined with a business model change. The technical change is the uh, autonomous driving. The model change, the business model change, which is the most dangerous thing, is that the power shifts from the manufacturers to the service uh, uh, industry. But the biggest opportunity is health. It's the only trillion opportunity that I know because we spend about 70% of the three trillion in the US on 
treating ill people only 30% and keeping them healthy. This is going to change to 50-50. It's a trillion dollar uh, change to e-health. So uh, to wrap up, we've arrived at a time in history uh, where evolution is coming to an end. And we, we started with Aristotle, and then uh, Bayes uh, said, well, it's actually not the syllogism, it's the uh, probabilities that are important. Alan Turing, a fellow of my college in Cambridge, King's College, told us what can be computed, and now we have these artificial intelligences. So humanity has a new partner. Uh, these are intelligent machines, and the key thing uh, for us to get right over the next decade or two is how to co-evolve with them. Thank you very much.